Hello and welcome to the second lecture of Fundamentals of Game Development. As you already have probably noticed, this course is fully uh, online course. So you are already given all the project assignments you can do. And on the course Moodle pages, we also have information on how you can get support, for example, from our course assistant, who is more than happy to jo uh, join uh, Teams meetings and have a chat with you about your problems with the course projects. Anyway, uh, today is the day we are publishing our second lecture for this year. And since this is a relatively new topic, we have been we have added this to the course. There's not much changes to the last year's uh, lecture, but anyway, here's the second lecture of the this year's course. And as always, the idea of these lectures or lecture videos is not to give you very detailed instructions on how to develop games or what to do next or how to implement a for loop or uh, anything like that in a game engine. It's more about to uh, give you ideas on topics on how software engineering dis uh, discipline and software engineering principles work in the game development context or what's the general way games are designed or next time what's the general features and general things you can do with a game engine uh, but anyway uh, let's move to the, to the today's topic so today's agenda will be twofold first we are going to go through some uh, fundamental aspects about game development tools so uh, what types of tools usually are associated with game development work and also what sort of tools you might want to check out if you are interested in a, doing a game development work in an industry. Also, we will be looking into seven different real-life game studios and what sort of tools they are using and uh, what sort of things and uh, technologies are important for the game studio. Uh, there are some differences between startups and established companies so you also might want to consider that aspect if you are interested in working in the games industry one day uh, from the game development uh, we'll also switch to game design principles so the task for you all on this course is to create your own game so on the latter part of this lecture we will be talking about the game design principles how you can get started with your own game design and again look into a real examples on how game studios design their products. Overall today's idea or the uh, point of this lecture is to give you some ideas on what sort of tools you might want to learn or what sort of things you want to emphasize when you are looking out for new skills and also help you get started with the game design work for your own game uh, product and also get an understanding on how the industry operates in general when they are doing designs for their new products. So overall there's uh, obviously a huge amount of information on today's uh, agenda and this also means that we can't go into very uh, small details on this lecture but still to give you some ideas on what tools we are talking about when I'm uh, mentioning game development tools or game development ecosystems or platforms and also how game design in general happens because this is something that differs uh, quite much actually from the software industry and software engineering work and software engineering design work when we are comparing the software industry and games industry against each other. So Let's start with the development tools. So uh, overall, this doesn't only include things like uh, programming tools or things that we use to write and edit or test source code. Uh, the development tools also uh, cover all the other things that are required for the game uh, project to be successful. This obviously means communications tools or work divisioning tools and all the other things that are required for the uh, game development process to happen and the game development team or the organization to function as a development uh, team or group doing a their first or the second or the end game and uh, 
and let's see uh, what sort of things they are and how they might differ from the uh, software development tools in general. Obviously, uh, this is a slide I usually show in almost all of these lectures because this is something that's really important and this is actually the cornerstone of this entire course. So game development and software development actually share some common features. This is a given fact because the games and our games and uh, game services or anything related to en entertainment software engineering is also a product or service which has been uh, designed and developed and someone has done programming work or software development to uh, make the game function in a computer setting or mobile phones or wherever it's running. So of course this also means that there will be a wealth of uh, similar tools. Actually uh, on my personal opinion uh, working with the both industries there are actually more things in common that most people in the either industry willingly admit. Uh, well, of course, because the software industry doesn't really want to admit that they sometimes do very ad hoc work. And on the other hand, uh, the games industry doesn't want to give, uh, uh, show itself as a software developers, but with a small twist. Uh, basically, uh, the design work uh, has some similarities. Of course, the game design is something that's completely different from collecting collecting requirements for making a new service or product but nevertheless the design work needs to happen and the design work needs to follow the same technical restrictions as most of the software development work because of course we are running the uh, games in the same hardware setups or the same hardware environments than most of the pro software products in general. Also the development work uh, considering programming tasks is almost basically the same. We select programming language, whether it's uh, C++, Java, or some uh, web development framework, or whatever it is, it's still programming work. So that's, the, uh, that's given. And actually, considering the development process, the continuous deliver, delivery model is actually something that's been used both by the software and games industry. Of course, with mobile games, the continuous delivery uh, is something that actually is more or less a thing that needs to happen because uh, most of the games are given as a free uh, applications and then you buy content and if you run out of content then you are not buying stuff anymore or you can't sell anything to a person who has no longer interest on your product well, whether it's a, that they didn't have one to begin with or because they have already seen and done everything available. So considering that the continuous delivery model and all the other continuous X models are actually something that's uh, uh, shared by both industries. The software developers are going towards that because of the software as a service thing and also because the software systems which are in cloud can be deployed and uh, they can take a, a roll back on the bad uh, patches or bad fixes and stuff like that but also the game developers who inherently have to work with the mobile environments and also with the modern uh, game consoles or well uh, direct download services like Steam this is something that can be done if something is broken then we can fix it or we'll roll back on a broken thing and fix, uh, make something that works instead uh, one of the best examples being the Red Dead Redemption 2 multiplayer mode which has been known to be broken several times already, but every time it's broken, there's always the option of trying to fix it and break it more or roll back on the changes and then just try to do something else. So it's more or less a living uh, product or living service, uh, which isn't set in stone because the, the developers are doing changes to the product throughout its life cycle. Of course, also tools and the tools that are used for testing and the testing work in, princi uh, in principle are the same. Of course, the testing has a different emphasis on other things, but in general, the software and game development projects all follow the same ideas in time, in budget, with the features and with the quality. This, of course, means that also the tools to manage or steer the development work 
of the development process are also more or less the same because even the uh, development process itself can be more or less the same. So obviously uh, against software development with the games there's always some differences. Uh, for example, uh, you have to have emphasis on customers and markets because uh, we are not providing something that is inherently uh, useful or generates money or saves money or saves time or something. In fact, we are making products that more or less waste time uh, to provide the customer with something they are interested in and provide them entertainment or a user experience they wish to have for the money they are using. This of course means also that there's no ready-made designs or mandatory decisions uh, which dictate what we are actually doing. So if we can design anything, uh, then or our story can be about anything ever. This also means that of course uh, there is no set rules. For example, if you are making a web store or making a uh, application you can use to see where the buses are and buy tickets and stuff like that, uh, of course you have already ready-made designs and or you have some mandatory decisions that needs to happen in a certain way. But of course with games there is really not that type of things. You are not restricted by the reality in most of the time unless we are talking about technical requirements which unfortunately still somewhat hamper the more crazier or wilder ideas. Uh, and this is actually something that's also related to the design work. So of course uh, with the game development or game design we have an artistic vision of what we want whether it's the team or the characters or whatever it is it's actually something that can be wildly abstract or, full or complete fantasy or science fiction, something that really doesn't exist or even can exist in our normal physical realm. So some designers are talking about the design work or the game development work that we are actually making dreams into reality or making dreams into interactive stories or inter interactive worlds where we can make things or do things and uh, see how the environment or the world interacts with us. Of course, my, one of my favorite uh, points on this artistic vision is that if we are talking something like a Katamari Damacy games, where the basic idea is that we are running a this small elf-like prince, or uh, his and or her cousins, and they, or the only thing they are doing is that they are rolling a ball, collecting things and making a uh, into this huge uh, katamari, which is just a collection of things. We roll over buildings, people, collect nails, even some small tools, animals, whatever, at the last stages even uh, oceans or countries or even stars and stuff like that. So basically completely a crazy fever dream, but it's actually something that was made into reality. With the software development tools, uh, uh, doing the implementation of the design ideas, which were completely crazy. But on the, uh, what, but on the uh, other side of the coin, what, even if the design work is something that comes from the imagination, or uh, more crudely said, also from the business decisions if we are running uh, a company doing games, the tools are not necessarily that different. We still use the same uh, Microsoft or open source or whatever tools to do the development work and we use the same testing suits to do testing work. We use the same deployment suits to do deployment into cloud systems. We still do the same container based or stateless uh, machines or stateless web services uh, to implement all the back back end stuff and the front end stuff is uh, developed with the game engine or something like that. So basically uh, we are using the same product, uh, things to, uh, to make the games than we use to make the software. And uh, of course, even though the sound design is something that's uh, not very, uh, that's very different from the software development, the sound design is something that's uh, fairly similar or actually the same tools that we already use, for example, in uh, music industry or when we are making movies or sound effects 
or even something more uh, everyday items like uh, uh, interactive help or in interactive counters or in elevators we, you get the bling and all the other thing sound effects uh, implicating that something has happened so this isn't while sound design or sound effect design is something that's not not inherently software development in a sense it's also it's in any way something that the people making software products or services or some types of products and services are still working with. So uh, overall, there's also a couple of uh, programming aspects that has emphasis on them. The client-to-client uh, -client multiplayer system, real-time multiplayer systems or 3D mathematics are actually very huge thing in game development. Also artificial intelligence in a sense. The game AI design and programming work isn't actually a real artificial intelligence in most of the cases. The system isn't capable of having an artificial thought, but it's an AI which can play the game or understands the rules enough or mimics the uh, player enough so that it gives you uh, an opponent which might not seem uh, like it's uh, cheating or using it on its own rules but it's still something that you have to be able to create and while the game AI is far away from the true AI systems or smart systems it's still uh, design work and programming working artificial intelligence and overall considering the user experience is the game fun or is the user experience something that we want to provide is of course always the one of the key things in the de in the development in the design and also in the testing work so of course these things are something that we have to design for we have to develop for and we have to test for so going further into the actual question that uh, what do you actually need to make games the shortest possible version i've heard of this is basically a computer a developer and a place to sit because fundamentally the games can be very simplistic uh, computer software uh, pro uh, products of computer software on the other hand uh, if you have multi-talented developer it's completely possible that they more more or less uh, make the products by themselves but of course, immediately, if you want to have some sort of a professional development project, you probably want to hire people who are more skilled than you at drawing things or animating things or doing the technical optimization of things or uh, selling things or working with things. Uh, from the technical point of view, uh, of course, the computer by itself isn't going to cut it. Uh, more or less, we need to have game designs, game designers and game design documents and game design uh, scale that we need to have prototypes. We need to test the proof of concept. We need to do feasibility testing. So we need to have game designs for all the, uh, the different parts of the product to understand and see that can it actually be done and does it actually work. We also need graphics. We need animation artists to create us an industrial or industry level, professional level product, because not everyone is capable of producing high quality animations or high quality graphics or high quality design. Also considering that we uh, would probably also ha want to have a person who is capable of working with the theme or the style required for this type of product. Of course, we need to have programmers, so we need to have programming tools, development engines, uh, development environment, software ecosystems, all the other normal stuff you would expect uh, when you are doing a programming and program development work. And of course, you need test audiences, so you need to have test cases, so you need to do uh, some sort of a plan on how to check out that everything in your product works. Finally, of course, besides doing testing work, doing feasibility testing, doing design work and development work, writing the code, 
you all, we also need other programming tools like version control tools or other management tools to uh, ensure that we actually can work together and the team isn't actually using its uh, resources or effort doing, uh, for example, the same things several times. So, and understanding who is doing what and dividing the work so that everything gets done, but no redundant work is done during the project. Also, if we go to uh, commercial projects, uh, we also tend to use auxiliary services such as physics libraries to uh, do optimized calculations or have our own person who is capable of creating such subsystems or uh, using or incorporating or embedding some sort of payment management system so that our customers can make these microtransactions and other stuff, buy things. Also cloud services for saving uh, the user profiles, the user safe games, so on and so on. But obviously on if we select the platform correctly, for example, mobile systems, we already have several options for payment management and cloud services provided by the uh, platform itself. So basically we are just using the APIs or other actually uh, access uh, roads to use these services without actually having to develop them by ourselves, unless we are a huge company and want to do it anyway. So, uh, of course, there's also different things that the different types of game, game studios tend to focus on. For example, uh, large game studios. They want to have focused professionals because they have already several people working for them. So they want to have the absolutely the best people for that role or that job they can possibly find. Meaning that if the startup companies are looking for all of our experts, meaning that you have to be competent on several things, and one thing, one thing is the one you are very good at. The, Actual game studios tend to want to have the very high level professionals, whether it's animation, whether it's graphics, sales, or programming work. Uh, from the software engineering perspective, this is actually very interesting because startup companies are looking for all around experts and they might be actually very happy to get a software de game developer, software developer, for games who is capable of working with Unreal Engine and maybe doing some small optimization or adding uh, extra scripts to optimize or make the game or make some things happen faster. Whereas the game studios themselves tend to look for high level professionals. And actually uh, what some of the companies list that if we know how to do C programming or low level C programming, optimizing the subroutines which do the calculations, then you are the correct person for us. Uh, more or less the studios say that whether you are a art director or developer or artist or mus musician or a business person, you need to have talent and passion for this work. Of course, some of this is a marketing gimmick and bullshit, uh, but what they actually mean is that they have no use for adequate or poor uh, or less than average talent. They want to hire very specialized people who are very capable in the one thing they are doing. And if we consider some tools these sort of people or these roles require, for example, the things listed here, Photoshop, 3D Studio, uh, even Blender, uh, the game engines, Unity, Unreal, or if we are working with the uh, some web game development and some other uh, web game engine uh, platform or ecosystem, sound editing, Audacity for sound editing work. And if we want to focus on exact programming languages, then of course Java, C Sharp, C++ are even things that are very common for all the game development projects. Uh, this more or less because, like mentioned earlier, the game development and 
software development isn't that uh, different uh, the, for animation, for drawing, for artists. The Photoshop 3D Studio Blender are no, completely normal tools they use to work. Similarly, in sound editing, Audacity is something that's very popular also because it's an open source tool. And the game engines Unity, Unreal, uh, some other uh, web uh, game engine tools, uh, game engine ecosystems are things that make it easier to express your designs or get things working. But on the uh, but on underneath everything, underneath the layers and layers of abstractions and tools, if you want to learn programming language, which makes you a game developer, that's Java, C sharp, C plus plus even. At least Java is something that's very, very common in almost all game engines, except Java code or some bastardization of Java. So considering that you don't need to necessarily just rely on my opinions here, we have an example of developer ecosystems in seven different game studios. This data was collected from our earlier studies into how game companies actually function and also uh, served as a sort of a way to uh, guide line for how, to, how we wanted to create this course. So on all these organizations, we interviewed several different people. These themes or these roles we just mentioned, we talked with team leaders, project managers, developers, testers, uh, upper management or the owner of the startup company and also lead designers or art designers if the company was large enough so that the art designer or art lead was someone else than doing the, the actual lead designer. And with them we talked about several different aspects on how these organizations develop their game from the viewpoint of quality assurance, from the viewpoint of uh, development, from the viewpoint of management, marketing, all the other things to understand how these organizations actually work. And uh, these were the companies we were working with. Of course, uh, due to confidentiality reasons, I can give you names, but I can tell you that all these companies were uh, working in the Northern Europe, some of them in one country, some of them in several, and all of these organizations uh, game development as their main uh, business source or main, uh, uh, main source of revenue. So we had a PC developers, we had console developers, we had mobile platform developers, and we had a company which was focusing heavily on browser games. Two of them are oh, sorry, three of them who are new startups making their first games or making their first real commercial uh, first real commercial product being earlier somewhat of a hobbyist group or releasing something not as a completely serious commercial product. Now, two of the companies were very established organizations which had uh, which had more than five products, actually the largest and oldest one had more than 10 released products on all the different uh, platforms uh, which you could imagine at that point for game development. So Xbox, PlayStation, PC, Steam, whatever. And, uh, and the rest of the companies were somewhere uh, in between. So overall, the production team sizes varied from less than 10 people, actually less than five people, to the largest organization having uh, almost 50 own persons and uh, employing uh, over 100 pe uh, people as a, as a third party uh, sub subcontractors. So basically, huge variance of organizations. So how do these different organizations develop their software or develop their games and products. Well, one of the in important uh, observations was that actually uh, the, when this uh, interview was done, uh, these 
huge uh, omnipresent game engines were more or less a new thing. World was about to uh, enter into the stage where some uh, game engines like Unity or Unreal or even Havoc, which was a big thing before Unity, uh, were uh, dominant systems in the industry. Actually, it used to be so that the uh, game development studios had to make their own game engines because uh, usually the existing engines were extensible enough uh, to use. On the other hand, uh, most of the organizations didn't really care what the developer used. As long as it was compatible with the project, the artists, the developers, the programmers could use their own tools. Personal preference on what they want to do, as long as it's compatible with everything else we have. And usually the problems uh, with the products, uh, especially in the more established companies, was that actually uh, the tools themselves were a bit restricted. Uh, there should be more extension modules so that there could be more features or abilities, ability to do better version control, for example. There's amount, there's a box in the system, in the software, meaning that when we are trying to find out what is going on, uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand if the bug is caused by the uh, game engine or physics library subsystem or our own programming work. So this is something that actually uh, cost a lot of time and in overall the design method for the organization was usually uh, using uh, some sort of documents and prototypes, meaning that we test everything with prototypes and make a a design based on the prototype so that we have something that's solid but also something that can be quickly thrown together if we want to try out a new idea. Also, uh, most organizations had some form of actual uh, knowledge transfer system, uh, whether it's a management tool or just email chains or something. Most organizations had at least some form of uh, managed communications. But of course, this is something that should be expected because it's also the same with the game, uh, sorry, software developing organizations. So what sort of tools these organizations then need? Well, one of the important things that we understood quickly was that there's actually two phases of game development. There's the pre-production uh, stage where we are trying out things. We are testing different ideas. We are testing different concepts, technologies, trying to find out the new best project ever. And then there's the production implementation phase where we are developing the product. So something that we have already committed to and want to make sure that it works and that it exists and so that we can later put it available somewhere and make money out of it. So of course this means that on the first uh, design stages, there's actually uh, differences in what is important. For example, the development tools, they are more about uh, doing a test graphics or may putting together a test prototype, whereas when you go into the production, it's more important to have your tools selected so that actually things function and these sort of problems where you need to do debugging or fix bugs both from your own product and also on the, on the third party tools is something that shouldn't be happening anymore. Of course, this also means that if we as an organization commit to some project or some production, then it means that we also test out the different documentation and cloud services and file sharing services before we start to work. Because for example, migrating version control services or the project repositories or uh, ticketing services or anything into another system uh, during the production cycle would just cost us money and be very 
inefficient way of doing things. So, uh, in general, uh, the game engines and other systems are used because they save time and money. Of course, uh, this also this only goes so far. The game engine and other complex systems or e uh, platforms are used uh, as long as we have need for them. For example, larger game studios tend to do mass customization or create their own game engine so that they have more say on how certain things behave or they want to have easier optimization or they want to have all uh, full control and all control on the uh, direction of the engine on their own hands. But uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be a C, uh, C sharp or uh, C uh, optimization programmer. You can have a completely valid job in games industry by just being a sort of a tool user meaning that if you are drawing something or animating something you are obviously going to be using animation or uh, drawing tools but even if you are a game developer uh, being a very good with some some game engine is also a valid strategy although it might be easier to get employed or find your own place if you also at the same time know how to optimize uh, subroutines or optimize computational routines with the C programming language. Of course, uh, on the games also, because we want to give the best impression, we want to, the games to look nice, we want the games to feel something that they should be, the artists usually are allowed to use whatever tools they want. Sometimes even the developers, as long as it compiles, and it's compatible uh, with the uh, with the other systems the organization is using, but uh, mostly the tool selection principles are more or less that the artists use what they are most comfortable with, and also uh, the organ if it's possible the organizations don't have very strict rules on what sort of an editing tool you should have or that everyone uses Visual Studio now or everyone uses uh, NetBeans or whatever to do the development work because the only thing that matters is that it's compatible with everyone else's work. So use the tools you can. And finally also if you are whatever you are using you need to be able to test out new ideas. So if you want to develop games, you need to have fast prototypes. And to have fast prototypes, you need to have sophisticated tools so you, so you can test out ideas, ways to move, ways to control things, attributes, all those different things. Because it's a waste of money and your time to implement something that actually isn't that funny or doesn't work or has to be cut from the end product. So do, using fast prototypes to explore the different options and solutions for designs or technical uh, uh, feasibility is actually a very, very needed uh, feature. Also, uh, this in general means that if you are making a tool for game developing company or games industry, you need to have easy prototyping and ability to design while implementing it. Because most games are designed while they are developed or while they are implemented. Because like said earlier, we are making someone's dream into a reality. So we need to be able to test out what sort of things work and what sort of things doesn't. And this is actually something that the tools always uh, always should allow. Uh, overall, the tools that are aimed uh, at the games industry, the tools that are used by the games industry without many or much usage in the software area, the most usual problems are that there's a num number of bugs then, or that the user interface design is bad and difficult 
how the tool makes itself unnecessarily complicated by hiding things or showing things so that it's not very intuitive. For example, I know that Unity Game Engine is something that has a very poor reputation because they keep changing things. And it's actually almost impossible to use at some stages because the things move around so much that even during one development cycle of six months, developing one game, mobile game from start to finish, the Game Unity game engine uh, used to have drastic changes in them. So it was a bit of a hindrance or even a bad thing for the or organization itself. So it, because it didn't, so it didn't do feature freeze or it didn't do long-term support. It almost started to uh, hinder itself by uh, competing against its own old, old versions of itself. And for example, on this particular course, uh, the Unity engine was used in a more prominent role, but because it kept changing and changing and changing, meaning that for every year, all the demonstrations, all the examples, all the other things, were broken because things had changed. And this is something that irritates me, well, irritated me, but you can imagine how this irritates someone who is actually working for a game studio and trying to make a professional game out of it. So uh, many organizations also aren't that large. Even if we are talking about huge organizations, which had a uh, dense and uh, founding subcontractors, hundreds of people working for them. Uh, there was a small uh, ma project management tool usage here and there, but usually the teams are small enough that the formal work divisioning tools, ticketing systems, these sort of things aren't necessarily needed. Well, the teams uh, are organized in a way that there's teams responsible for different things and they do their own thing and when they get that thing done then they compare and try to in integrate things into each other. And overall as uh, this is very important uh, observation for you so uh, before about 2010 most game developing studios were actually uh, developing also their own engines because there were no universal or well uh, tailorable engines available anywhere, but this is something that has ceased to exist. But on the other hand, uh, if you are a large game studio, which needs to push the envelope further and further and further uh, and make innovation happen, these people actually do need to do programming work, not uh, game development with uh, some uh, engine. So if you are a software engineer who has uh, good skills on C, C++ programming, understanding of how low level systems, for example, based on Unix and system programming work, then you actually are already uh, a person who has a skill set that is very valuable to the games industry. So this also is something that might surprise some of the people. If you are a very good C programmer, you actually are very attractive to some game studio company. So uh, that's for the uh, software development tools or software development skills more or less. So let's take a look into the basics of game design. This is something that we already touched upon, touched upon a bit uh, on the uh, earlier lecture last week, but let's look through some couple of other pointers to get you started on how to design your own games or how to get started with your own game design idea. So first of all, this is something that I really need to emphasize for you. If you cannot express your great idea with the maximum of three slides and five minutes, it is a bad idea. This is something that was told to me by one of the lead designers of a game series which went to 
sell platinum in, an, in Asia. So I guess that person actually knows what they are talking about. But this is actually a very good uh, summary or rule of thumb if you are designing something, especially considering that on this course, we want to keep the design simple and neat because we don't have that much time or resources to do these things anyway. So unless you can express your idea with maximum of three slides and five minutes, then you might want to revisit or rethink your idea. Also, if we go into the real world, there is a, a notation that sometimes a stupidly simplistic idea is something that works very well, whereas something that sounds very interesting and sounds very engaging is actually quite boring and bad. So this also is something, is also a reason why the prototyping approaches are used. Of course, you need to start with an idea which is easy to explain and simple to show, but also you need to test out things beforehand because sometimes boring ideas make great games and great ideas make boring games. And that's just something that's a fact of life. So, how do we then design the games? Well, Considering these organizations I just mentioned, these seven game studios, combined them have something like 30 commercial products with them. So there has been several times when the game design process has been uh, followed through. Unfortunately, uh, there is no silver bullet here. Most game designs are actually just concepts that just came out of someone's imaginations. Some individual came up with an idea or some team worked in a pitching contest or some other way came up with a plan based on media trend jokes. Some point of consider that this, this might be interesting. This is how most of the game designs actually Happen. Someone gets an idea, makes a, proto makes a prototype or a small pitching deck, a uh, couple of uh, concept art graphs, and there you have it. So basically, uh, if you don't have any way or any idea on how to get started, uh, you might want to consider how do I make a game? Well, how do I make a funny game? How do I make exciting thing or something that's new, novel, interesting, or something that works against the user expectations so that it's actually something that gives us the look and feel of the uh, game? And it, can, it doesn't have to be something that's just like light, light switch going on in your head. It doesn't have to be that. On this example, for example, I have uh, made a short work of brainstorming session or ideas, a summary of brainstorming session or ideas pitching contest, which steers a, an a idea towards something that can be implemented as a game. So we start with, start with a simple idea. We have a car and it's driving down the road in a crowded city center. Okay, we know that this is actually something that can already exist as a game, so it can be a road racing game. But how about we make the car an erratic elephant who uh, tries to avoid damaging the city? So it's kind of a runaway, runaway game, runaway elephant game. Okay, that sounds nice. But how about if we give that elephant a purpose? We make the elephant uh, try to uh, run down the city and try in a crowded city center, avoid damage, and we, don't, we, so, we also don't want to uh, make the game violent. So let's remove people and let's put pigeons on, on instead of them. So they, uh, the pigeons are the flying rats of all the metropolitan cities. People tolerate uh, things more on them than actual humans. So of course, we still have animals in it, so let's make it a cartoony game. 
so it's not actual animal use in graphic details the game uh, it's uh, something uh, more uh, funnier or cartoony so we have a cartoon elephant running down the pigeons in a crowded city center so why did we have an elephant running down the city center so let's put a circus in Let's put clowns to chase down the player elephant, and the player elephant is chasing down the pigeons who are in the city center. Of course, this is already something that might be funny, uh, but let's make it a bit weirder. Let's make the light posts and other, uh, uh, other signs, living things, which are trying to trample or beat the elephant down somehow. So, okay, now we have a a uh, cartoon elephant who is running down the pigeons uh, in a crowded city center while avoiding traps set by a bunch of clowns and avoiding being trampled and beaten by the light posts and all the signs and other suitable objects of the city. So, okay, now things are happening. So let's add a story on, the, on top of it. So we have a cartoon elephant which is running down the pigeons in a crowded city center while avoiding traps set by a bunch of clowns and avoiding being trampled and beaten by the light post like stick figures in an open city landscape run crazy by a yodeling supervillain robbing the place with the pigeons and using the light post stick figures as his guards. And our elephant is hunting them for justice. And there you have it. That's a game design. That's your initial draft. Now let's make a couple of ideas. Let's make a ball running through the city maze, running over things, add some other things, make a couple of a uh, couple of uh, test uh, graphics, see what would look nice, what would look cartoony. Make a graphics portfolio of things that you want to have the game look and feel, and there you have it. You have nailed it. The first initial game design. So it doesn't have to be difficult, and it doesn't have to be a very interesting idea. So yeah, the initial idea can be at where we have a car driving down the road in a city center, stuck in the traffic. And then finally, we have a yodeling supervillain, and we are using an elephant to hunt down pigeons. So actually, uh, that example might sound a bit well, stupid, really, but uh, it's not that far from actual game design process. Of course, if we have a commercial aspect in the game design, it also means that it has to have some connection to the... Oh, no, we have to have some idea on what might sell, what our customers are expecting, what sort of things are considered interesting and what sort of things are considered old news right now. Of course, uh, if we have commercial interest in a game design, we cannot usually just uh, hope that our crazy idea uh, works. We need to have something that's proven or that we have a couple of prototypes that our test audiences like something and we go to, towards that direction. So basically the same idea, but with a bit more uh, conservative steps. Of course, considering the games industry, what's today's super hit is tomorrow's old news. So of course, new ideas are always welcome, but of course, realistically, uh, the game studios are not that liberal and wild with their ideas. You tend to copy your competition or tend to follow the same similar paths and similar ideas so you come up with the similar types of products because they all, all not only because uh, they are easy to make but because they seem to sell they ensure that you have a certain audience and it's not a not a gamble to create such a product well it is but not as much of a gamble but of course, this being a university course, and uh, we don't have monetary uh, assets considered here, well, not besides the game, uh, the game design plan anyway, I'd hardly recommend and encourage you to use the go crazy design. 
So make something that's funny, that's something that's new, that's novel. Don't make a 15th rollerball with a small changes in theme. Try to do something completely crazy and bonkers, because that's also some way that you can enjoy this uh, course more. Make some designs that are actually new and interesting and novel, because you can continue with that idea, or you can continue with these sort of uh, approaches later on, and you have the entire rest of your life to design the Wall of Call of Medal of Honor of Duty of Justice 15 uh, games. And of course, uh, considering this uh, from the perspective of real life, uh, of course, if we have uh, to design, have to design real product, especially if we are startup, we have to uh, go with what pays, what makes us money, what's most likely to reach our target audience, and then we make it well enough, we just liked enough. And, uh, and uh, then when we have uh, some success underneath our uh, in our portfolio or in our existing product catalog, then we might start to do our own things and uh, different things. Of course, uh, there's a couple of more uh, small differences on the game design and software design, which are worthwhile to mention. Of course, game developers are, uh, or they consider themselves to work in a creative industry. Software engineers, software developers in software industry don't tend to think that. Or they might think that solving problems with the programming languages might be creative problem solving, but actually the industry itself isn't that creative. But the game developers are always considering themselves to be in the creative industry. But the key word here is industry. They aren't artists for art's sake. They are trying to make money. They are trying to make profitable products. If they happen to make something that's creative and artistic, that's also nice. But if you have, are presented, you are, uh, present the dilemma of ha having a huge amount of money out of your products or having uh, products that are very famous, but don't make you that much money, most of the people working in the games industry also always think that it's the money that's the thing, because they are not doing art for art's sake. And of course, the idea with this is that, of course, the creative artistic merits uh, Game of the Year awards, these sort of things are always nice, and uh, but they are not necessarily things that are sought after if we can make or make the game studio a success uh, without them. Also, of course, because we the organizations are making designs that need to reflect the user experience, that is that something that the users might want, or that is something that the users expect. Uh, it also means that the technical design relies on prototypes and the game concepts are constantly challenged. The game companies, game studios even expect that things change at the late, late stages of development or that they, don't, they necessarily don't ever have a complete design, they just add things with, which makes the game or the product towards something that the audiences seem to like, because the game development is more or less continuous delivery. So not only are the chain, late changes allowed, they are expected that and sometimes even the games are launched in a way that you can select a couple of best branches uh, for further development if you are not certain on which way the game uh, design should go. And of course, uh, considering the games industry in a whole, 
the game products are designed with creative processes, which actually uh, are rather close to the similar uh, approaches that, for example, movies take. We test a couple of actors, we test a couple of ideas, we test a couple of scripts, and then we finally commit to certain script, certain manuscript, certain game design document, with certain features, with certain actors, which with certain characters and art tiles, for ex styles, for example. So, uh, in this sense, the games industry, yes, it's artistic work, and game products are art in a sense. But more or less, the game, uh, but uh, but the games are not art for art's sake. They are fun products, fun services, and the organization organizations are making them to make money and be able to make more games or make more money, whatever. But still, the idea was that the organizations try to develop a fun product or the product that their customers are looking for. And if it's art, then it's also a nice thing to have, but it's not always necessary. But in a sense, yes, the games and movies are similar products in design. So, uh, taking a quick look, because, well, this isn't very in, important for this lecture, but if we take a quick look at the how the games are designed by these same uh, case studios we watched earlier, uh, the design phase, it's uh, almost always something that it's good mechanics, concept demos, test mechanics, design of all thing, of things, make something that's marketable in the future. And the design method is always, well, idea pitching, prototypes, uh, vision group work, prototypes, vision, brainstorming, prototypes, prototypes and vision. So basically, there's no silver bullet here. The idea is to have a this sort of a core concept or quick abstract or idea, test out with the prototype if it works, and if it works or seems to work, then we might want to uh, commit to it. Basically, all organizations have minor, uh, major changes in their products. All the couple of companies said that they only had minor changes. But on the other hand, they were also making a product that was almost, uh, that was more or less uh, something that's fair, that was fairly simple thing to do. Platformers, I think that the one organization was making a electrical, electric version of an existing board game. So of course you'd expect that that doesn't get that many changes because the gameplay and the rules elements are already there. So basically, uh, also who designs your game is, well, usually the company has a lead designer or it's the uh, producer who is also the project manager in a smaller, uh, smaller productions or smaller game studios who is the person making the design. And of course, all organizations more or less are going with the money if they have to uh, select if they want to innovate or if they want to have money. So basically, it means that if we are talking about commercial game development, we are also uh, talking about the situation where we need to really understand who our customers are, what sort of products do they want, what sort of uh, games do they expect, what sort of uh, things interest them. Of course, there's a several places in the history where this has gone wrong. For example, LucasArts Games decided to stop making adventure games because they found out that the average 14 to 25 uh, male the, uh, target audience doesn't actually care about adventure games. And this was the game studio that made the best adventure games in the genre. So, of course, there's missteps here and there. For example, in this case, the game studio didn't understand that they are the niche owner. Even if the niche isn't something that's majorly popular, you are still making money out of it because you are the niche owner. 
But of course, this is more or less marketing things. But if we look for the sources of innovation here, well, movies, trends, success stories, prior experiences, old games, old games, TV, books, the prior experiences, competition analysis. So basically, uh, there is a saying that the uh, biggest the, or the greatest form of flattery is stealing someone else's work. So basically, uh, the game designs in a commercial design work has to rely on something that probably sells or something that has known qualities in it. But if we are working with the uh, Working with the designs on this sort of university course, we can go crazy. But of course, this is this is something that doesn't necessarily work in the games industry. So, a couple of ideas on how do you sh how you should start working uh, with your game. Now that if we if you follow this go crazy style of brainstorming approach, you probably come up with some couple of ideas on what sort of things you want to have. But how about the content itself? Of course, almost always you want to design things based on this activity cycle. This is actually something that's lifted uh, directly from our gamification and game full design plan. But it also, of course, means that this is something that's fairly uh, fundamental thing in uh, user experience design or game design. So motivation comes from taking an action which is meaningful in the game context and it, the action gives you feedback which somehow alters your, experience, uh, your usability or user experience or gives you some positive reinforcement that you are doing useful things which, generate, which generates your motivation to do further actions and so on and so on. So basically, if you destroy the monsters, you get the loot, you get new, which allows you to buy new equipment, which makes it possible that you can kill bigger monsters and so that you get loot and you can get new weapons and so on and so on. So it might seem simplistic here, but this is more or less how the user experience is built. You have a motivation to do something, you do it, and you get feedback, which creates a positively reinforcing cycle. Also, with this cycle, you need the balance act, the flow between the boredom and anxiety. We all know that there are super difficult games, for example, for game consoles. Dark Souls are very not well known for these sort of high uh, difficulty aspects. On the other hand, if we are playing some children's games, there's actually a possibility that the games are very simplistic itself. But of course, you need to select your audiences to understand what you are making. Regardless of uh, what, you are, uh, what your uh, target audience is, you are also always working against this flow. So we are, you are motivating your user to take an action and providing feedback so that they will do something else. Of course, the player gets uh, skills, player gets more experience, player as a person, not the character they are playing, but the person knows how the game for, works and expects it to challenge the player more. So this means that the game has to offer new things, new enemies, new abilities, new levels, new challenges in general, so that the player doesn't get bored. If the game gets too samey or there's not new content to unlock, of course the player gets bored. Or at the same time, if the game just throws the player in the deep end of the pool and says that sink or swim, then the player, of course, gets frustrated and anxious because the game is too difficult. He, uh, they don't survive. So you have to be able to find the flow, the sweet spot for how your game progresses 
from the first tutorial levels towards the last uh, challenges before the uh, game ends. And this is also some, this is something that if you want to read more about the game design principles, is called progression stairs. So the game teaches you uh, for a couple of levels or the early part of the level ways to do new things. It allows you to rest, take your time, prepare for the next boss. And then you have a boss fight, which is a trial. If you pass it, then you are allowed to rest again. You are taught a couple of more new things. You are given possibility to prepare for the next fight and so on and so on. So the required effort increases, the difficulty increases, and if the player is following the path, at least to some way, in the way which you designed it, then the player gets more uh, skilled, experienced, and the flow happens or not. If the player finds the game too challenging or too easy, then it's just the player preferences are not matching with your product or something else, but this is how it happens if you if it ever happens. Finally, uh, when you are making the game design, so of course you need to consider that you need to have some interaction. You need to have some way to enable the flow. You need to have some sort of way to make the levels progress, but also you of course need to have the initial concept whether it's the elephant in the city center or whatever it is, when you get this idea, uh, you need to write down these aspects, the general theme, the main characters, what your, the, the genre of your game will be. What are the important features? Do you have story if, it, if you have what it is? And if you want to try something very strange or very challenging, what sort of technical decisions do you have? For example, do you want to control the game only by camera or shaking the phone or whatever you are doing? Also in the course context, what are the mechanics that you should learn before you can implement it? What would be the tutorials that would actually benefit your design so that you actually get something that's worthwhile from the tutorial projects so that you can implement your own game with the same ideas and only just learn a couple of more things. So these are the things that you, pro you should take into account when you are selecting the tutorial projects and also while at the same time thinking that what would be the game you are implementing on this course. So go take that template, it's there, don't write on that one, uh, copy your own uh, document and use that as a starting point. So what sort of things you need to get your own game done? And based on that, what tutorials you need to, so that you have technical skills to start working on the game? And then what uh, also learn more, what are the things that you need to learn by, more by yourself so that you actually get the game implemented? before end of the November, when we have a deadline for all the deliverables. And there you have it. So uh, that was the second lecture about how do we design games and what sort of tools we have. Uh, use the template, go check it out, and then you can start designing your own game project. Anyway, uh, if you need any help, uh, please feel free to email me or use the Moodle pages and contact the course assistant who can then instruct you with more detailed or technical problems. Of course, if you are using very esoteric game engine, uh, you might not be able to get the exact answer, but at least you will be able uh, to work with our course assistant to get ideas on what to try next. So anyway, uh, have a fun, try to at least try to have fun with the course, uh, start your own game design and uh, start uh, considering what sort of game or what sort of thing would interest you so that you can design it and create it for everyone else on the course to see. 
but uh, that's uh, that for now. Uh, have a nice rest of the week and see you next time. Bye.